and welcome to our third episode of our new Frequently Asked Questions series on Immersion Cooling Solutions. As before, we've been consolidating questions we get regularly from inquiries and we've put them together here for you. This episode focuses specifically on the IT integration partnership Asperitas has with IT Renew. I hope you enjoy learning all about it. Let me introduce our speakers for today. Andy Young, CTO at Asperitas and Eric Rydell, Senior Vice President of Engineering. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Amelia. Yeah. You're welcome. So before we begin, um, Eric, could you talk a little bit more about IT Renew's partnership with Asperitas? A absolutely, yeah. Our partner partnership with Asperitas is really an example of, of circular economy uh, at its best. So we, we've got a, a truly sustainable data center model that helps reduce waste and CO2 production in multiple uh, dimensions, as, as we'll see as we go through. And so the idea is to, to continue to meet the demands for, for high density computing, right? System level and uh, individual server level, but keeping the, the total costs and you know, TCOs uh, to a minimum and always keeping sustainability uh, at the forefront. So um, we're really excited for this, uh, this great example of, uh, of open partnership. Nice, thank you for explaining that. Okay, well, let's begin with the first question. What is the solution with IT Renew, Eric? Yeah, so um, we've um, IT Renew has been working with uh, the largest hyperscalers in the industry for uh, for nearly two decades. Right? Um, we've also been active as has Asperitas with the Open Compute Project that that really helps advance the technology underlying that. But we're also involved in the day-to-day -day deployment, design, integration of these systems. So we've really seen as computing has has evolved. Um, in the last five and, and 10 years for just these, these massive, uh, massive computing needs. And of course, even the changes uh, over the last year. Um, with our uh, integrated rack scale solutions, um, Sesame is able to provide the advantage of hyperscale to a much wider audience. So we work with service providers of all sizes. We work with enterprises that have all different reasons that they might want uh, on-premise hardware. And we're able to provide racks and tens of racks and, and dozens of racks and thousands of nodes um, at, uh, at very um, scalable uh, economics and with, uh, with sustainability uh, at the forefront. So customers are really able to, to take their IT dollar far further um, as well as um, be you know, more, much more reasonable uh, stewards of the environment than, than some of the, um, the standard trends. And so it, it's very easy to, uh, to go fast with these servers and to grow fast as workloads expand and applications expand. Interesting, thanks for explaining that, Eric. Let's go on to the next question. Andy, I think I believe this would be for you. Can I use standard hardware? I know this has been asked before, but it would be worth clarifying here in relation to the IT Renew case. Absolutely, so we regularly take standard hardware and use it for immersion. Um, and the great thing about the partnership with IT Renew is it makes it particularly easy to do this. We know what's coming. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's easy to work with and there's uh, ways that we can immerse that without a lot of customization being necessary. Um, the business model of IT Renew is, is great because the cooling demands are well within our, our comfort zone for immersion cooling. And um, we can de-risk the, the, the process uh, for the end user. And as you can see on the screen here, lots of examples of the technical depths we go into the offline work uh, to uh, ensure that we have a solid solution through a solid process that we call certification. Uh, so we, we take the, the standard equipment and we put it through a process First, through simulation, as you can see on the top left, sort of uh, simulating the way in which the fluid flows, through to physical prototyping, and then uh, gauging the cooling water requirements, depending on the amount of uh, duty or sort of heat that's uh, generated. And uh, yes, yeah, so whether it's a simple or complex, if it's a CPU or GPU uh, server or combinations of, uh, then we have solid processes that are hardwired in how we work and uh, knowing the equipment coming from IT Renew uh, enables us to do all of that work ahead of time so it really is a, a plug and play solution. 
Nice. Okay, thanks, Andy. Let's move on to the next question. How many of you are in one system? And Andy, I really, if you could um, uh, talk through a little bit more about this, please. Yeah, so on the slide, you can see some, some uh, images. And so if you look at this from left to right, so uh, a traditional rack um, uh, through to an OCP rack and an, an Asperitas immersion called uh, module, as, as we call it. So, um, and if you look at the numbers, uh, you can see as we move from a traditional to OCP through to immersed, uh, the amount of uh, fans are uh, reducing. Uh, and which is great because it means that the friendly domain is is uh, getting uh, less and less of a risk. Uh, the power requirements are reducing, but also you you can hopefully see that the number of CPUs is also going up. So in general terms, if you think about a rack, then you know 42U uh, would be one of the standards. But really, it's how much compute we can pack into the floor tile area of of the device. Um, the immersive solution can can enable you to have a higher density of CPUs. Uh, our particular uh, product, as you can see it, uh, is a 24U solution. Um, but really it's, it's, it's how much compute you can pack into that space that counts. So no fans, more CPUs, um, and of course, all the benefits of immersion cooling along with that. Thank you. And Eric, would you like to add anything to that? I get the sense Andy's really explained that quite well, but just in case there's anything missed here that you'd like to add. Yeah, sure. I, I just want to would emphasize again um, what Andy started with is that the the design here is is also you know with the fans removed, for example, but other um, kind of design aspects of OCP. It's it's simpler design, more scalable design, easier to service. That means there's less components, which also means less failures and less cost is built in, right? So it, it's, a, it, it's a very kind of virtuous cycle when kind of the, the, the simplification um, thinking of, of OCP design just says, you know, let's look at all the components in the system. Are these really necessary? Can these be done in a, um, in a more effective way? And, and that really improves um, the cost model because there's less components, the reliability model because there's less components and, and less failure modes, and then uh, the density, right? So we, we can maximize the amount of material um, inside the, the racks that's doing computing versus uh, doing uh, you know, other accessory things like, uh, like moving air around. I see, uh, thanks for that further clarification, Eric. Uh, let's move on, shall we? Okay. Are there standards for IT in immersion? Now, I think this may be you, Andy. Yeah. Sure. Well, OCP don't set standards per se, but they certainly provide a great community to which we can uh, develop some, some ways of working. Um, so OCP, the Open Compute Project, um, is something that Aspertas and IT Renew have been um, involved with. I think the word we use is heavily involved. Um, <laughs> right, Eric. So, so there's yeah. So, in terms of the immersion cooling, uh, but also in terms of the coolants that are used, the actual dielectric uh, coolants which are used. On the screen, you can see a great example of the um, some normality or standardisation in the way in which we configure the IT equipment inside what we call the cassette. So the, the cassette is like the um, rack mounted uh, unit and that, that drops in vertically to the uh, module and therefore into the dielectric liquid. So there's a standard size uh, based on 1U, 2U or indeed OU uh, heights. Um, the, the interfaces with power communication um, and the module itself are standardized. Um, and the way in which we work with the IT equipment is shown by the colors. So generally speaking, due to natural convection, the coldest uh, fluid is at the bottom. That's where we would promote those uh, components that need the greatest cooling, either, either due to their temperature tolerance or due to the power which they evolve into the liquid. So the blue zone is where we put the high power, high sensitivity equipment. And then it, as you move up and up on the cassette, you then have different um, environments locally 
according to the other equipment that you want to call, be that drives, power supplies, network interface cards, and, and so on. On the right-hand side, you can see two examples. And so uh, the three blue um, stripes uh, that you can see, these would be uh, seven-inch uh, server boards, uh, each, each having two CPUs. Uh, and at the bottom, that, that, that gray box at the bottom would be where you uh, typically place the power supplies. On the right is more of a, a, um, an example for storage, or indeed we use this layout typically also for CPU, GPU combinations. Uh, so you can see that, that there's a thought process behind it, some rules of thumb that we use, and ways of thinking about how we place equipment. So when we look at IT Renews equipment, this is what we, we, we project it into, and this is how we uh, certify uh, by simulation and by test to see whether the strategy for uh, space claim and layout is giving us the, the right thermal performance that we need. Exactly. I mean, it's clear to see that, I mean, it's good, to, obviously, to have these standards for IT and immersion, right? Um, and Eric, I'm sure you agree. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think it, it, it's hard to, to say enough about the power of, of OCP and open really in this model. Uh, so th this will be, I believe this year, or the very beginning of next year will be the 10 year anniversary of, of OCP. And I recall at the beginning, you know, folks were saying, you know, in, in the press, you know, this is never going to last, you know, the vendors working together and, and sharing and, and not, uh, and not arguing and, um, and, and there's still, there's still some, uh, some animated discussions of, of course, in those meetings, but uh, this is just much more, uh, a much more efficient process uh, to do all this, right? So I, I've been working in, um, hyperscale computing my entire career, and and the idea that we would get you know sometimes four, five, maybe ten uh, vendors in the room with all the the best expertise um, from those those different angles that uh, that the different vendors uh, use, and then also get end users right like an AT and T or Goldman Sachs or Facebook uh, into those rooms, so that we're really considering the the solution end to end right. We're not just just engineering uh, in the corner. So it's it's really a, a a massive leverage, and I think that this uh, you know this the cassette and and our just our collaboration with uh, with Asperitas generally is uh, is just a testament to how much more powerful we we as an industry are when we when we work together and uh, uh, and and figure out the best solutions on behalf of the customers. Absolutely, yeah, I completely agree with that one. In ten years as well, I hadn't realized it had been that long. Wow. Okay, now, this next one, this is a great one. Um, and Eric, I'd like you to start us off on this one. Why does sustainability matter beyond the obvious, of course? Yes, of course, yeah. And and so as uh, as as we'll see in the uh, in in the in the slide material here, um, there's really um, we see three aspects where there are are substantial uh, savings here, right? And um, and the first one is in the environmental impact. So um, based on our model with the, the circular economy, um, we're able to eliminate in, in many cases, um, kind of the average case, up to 75% of the CO2 that's tied to the manufacturing of the IT equipment, right? So what's generally known as scope three um, emissions, right? The, um, or otherwise the embedded, embodied energy um, in the various uh, components uh, of the system. And and by providing kind of extended life and um, uh, you know extended usability um, for uh, for these systems, we're able to avoid um, additional uh, carbon uh, CO2, additional materials um, that that have to be mined uh, from the ground. There's energy for that. There's transportation for that. Right. So there's there's kind of a huge uh, a huge impact in the uh, in the embodied energy kind of scope three. Um, in addition, we do also leverage um, some of our geographic reach. So we have um, 12 facilities um, worldwide where we, um, where we process material, and we'll process between 35,000 and 100,000 servers per month worldwide across that facility. So it's a huge uh, volume um, of material that we draw from uh, for Sesame. And for systems that we deploy in Europe, we, we produce, we source the material in Europe whenever we can. We um, pr uh, build the systems in Europe and ship them from Europe. Um, in, in North America, we do it from several facilities in, in North America. And over time, we'll also build out uh, systems in Asia. So there's all, again, another layer of savings in reduced transportation, uh, you know, reduced uh, logistics costs. So that's the first one. There's a huge fraction of, of avoided CO2 
But what's also super attractive for our customers is that we offer um, for, for our general purpose solutions, um, a 50% reduction in the TCO compared to traditional models uh, of doing IT. And that goes directly to the, to the bottom line um, of our customers. So um, in addition to being much more environmentally friendly, um, we save our customers half the cost on a, on a, dollar, a dollar per month uh, basis, right? And then finally, with some of the leverage, um, including with the, the technology from, from Asperitas, we're able to reduce the day-to-day -day operational cost, right? The total amount of energy, the energy that isn't being used to, uh, to move the fans, um, the natural uh, convection uh, in, inside the tanks, rather than uh, in mechanically um, using electrons to, um, to move uh, air or, uh, or fluid. Um, and the, the increased density, right? Like we already said uh, in, the, in answer to the previous question, um, so much more of the material uh, inside the tank can be done, uh, can be used for computing, um, for, for addressing applications and, and serving videos or, uh, or, or processing uh, algorithms. And, uh, and that's really where the, the value comes to, to the customers and, and to, the, to the public at large, right? So really three areas where we're able to um, reduce waste, um, reduce the carbon footprint without, without compromise. So, so this is not, um, you know, it, uh, it costs a bit more. In fact, this costs half as much as a, as a standard solution. Well, 50%, that's, that's loads. It's good to see those layers of how valuable it really is as well. And Andy, I believe that you can really explain more about what Speritas brings to the table on this subject. Well, I mean, I think um, there is something to add, but just to acknowledge that this is an amazing um, uh, proposition, in fact, uh, for, for uh, saving carbon and cost. Um, I think uh, what I would add to that is that I think it's great that during the first life of the IT equipment is that in, in its sort of second half of that, shall we say, that it's, it's uh, going to be an environment which is going to get the best out of it. So the, the better we cool, the longer the life is going to be of the equipment. So it's, it, it's extending its life further because it has a great cooling environment. Uh, Alex already mentioned about the uh, energy reduction that it, it has in the immersion environment due, due to the, the lack of uh, fans and pumps and so on. Um, but also the, the, the other thing to bear in mind is the stability of the environment. So the cooling and immersion, you know, when the, the uh, power load is, is, is bearing up and down, um, the yeah the, the 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 stability that it brings uh, really is going to give it uh, the longest life possible. So that that I think is is a great uh, combination. Also, um, if sustainability is really a big decision factor, which it should be for all of us in in how we we uh, work going forwards, um, the the potential for reuse of the heat that's generated is of course there too. So all of the heat that's uh, generated. All the work that those electrons are doing, uh, as Alec puts it, um, actually, as you know, thermodynamically gets evolved at, as heat, uh, because but through immersion cooling, this is all captured to water, and uh, because the power demand from the IT equipment is well within our capabilities, we can run the system in a way where the return temperatures of, the, of that water are in a good uh, range to promote heat reuse. So actually, there's a couple of points that really add to the already great credentials that this solution has for the sustainability. I see. OK, thanks both for explaining that so eloquently. Um, let us move on to the next question. What are the product specs, Eric? Sure. Yeah. So, so I mean, there's obviously a lot of detail here, and and I encourage folks to to reach out or uh, you know uh, uh, take a look at the uh, at the IT Renew website or or reach out to to any of us directly um, for detailed questions. But just to to overview, right? The the generalized approach that we're taking at uh, at IT Renew with the Sesame product line is to do rack integrated server storage and networking. And so we're putting, you know, as as was already in the previous slides, you know, 48 uh, nodes in an air cooled, 72 in the uh, in the Asperitas solution. Um, we have some uh, smaller single socket nodes that that go um, up to uh, up to 100 nodes, 
and then, um, but really for, for our most successful customers, our, our you know, customers that are really taking advantage of it, they are taking five, 10, uh, 20 racks uh, from us. So they're thinking about uh, fleets of, of nodes in the hundreds or potentially thousands, right? Now the, the hyperscalers are, of course, they're in the 10,000 or a million, but one of the most important things that, that we're doing here, you know, after, after all these years of, of innovation in, in OCP and, and in hyperscale generally, we're able to bring that to a much, a much smaller audience, right? Or a much, uh, sorry, a much wider audience with, um, with, uh, uh, with much more modest systems um, as a starting point. So uh, a, an enterprise or, or a service provider that, that might start with one rack or two racks, um, it's very straightforward. They can call us up and, uh, and say, hey, I need two more racks. And then uh, two weeks, three weeks later, um, we can deliver those. We roll them uh, literally um, off, the, off the truck and into the data center, um, pre-configured. Um, we also uh, preload software in ways that, that when, when that makes sense. So um, the, the kind of our aspirational promise for those customers is 60 to 90 minutes from truck to, uh, uh, to running a workload, right? Roll the rack into the data center, plug it into the floor uh, for power, plug it into the wall for uh, networking and, um, and be running workload um, within 60 to 90 minutes, right? And, um, and, and we think we can achieve uh, a similar uh, scenario um, with, the, with these joint solutions, right? And then, of course, um, you know, the general specs, you know, we have single socket nodes, we have dual socket nodes, we have um, flash, um, our largest system can do eight petabytes um, of, uh, of flash in a rack, um, we can do over, um, over 10 petabytes of, uh, of, um, of, of hard drive storage, and then um, the network connectivity. Right, also super dense, right? Our default is 25 gig networking uh, to the nodes. It's really a, a standard, has been a standard in hyperscale, um, but is, is still um, you know, emerging in, in some new data centers and 100 gigabit uh, across the rack, right? Um, with new solutions even at 400 gig. So um, very um, scalable, very powerful computing and uh, accessible for a, a wide range um, of, uh, of, of customers' most demanding applications. Impressive. Uh, Andy, have you got something to, to add to this? Well, only, only to say that um, across that full range, which is really uh, fantastic, um, yeah, there's, there's uh, solutions to, to cool that equipment uh, uh, with immersion uh, to a spare gas. And so, um yeah so there's there is you know for, for the networking the power and the storage and the compute it's it's all there uh, ready to go yeah absolutely okay uh right well, let's move on shall we eric i think this will be back to you for this one what is meant by the circular approach by it Rumi? Sure. Yeah. So the so the circular economy uh, is a term that that has existed for uh, for a number of years um, in other um, in in other industries, right? Um, and it's um, it's maybe you know three, four, five years um, in the IT industry, and uh, the idea is, is really twofold. So one we've already talked about, kind of life extension uh, of the hardware, so keeping the hardware in service uh, for longer. Um, with additional kind of reliability design, with with that um, that stable environment that uh, that Andy talked about, um, for example, in the uh, in the immersion mindset. So that's absolutely one. So so extending the life rather than just oh it's it's been three years it's time to to buy new systems and throw out the old systems. Um, you know the the workloads um, are really uh, amenable to uh, to continuing to use those systems, and that's the core of what we're facilitating, right? And, and ultimately, the way that we do that with, um, you know, we mentioned at the front, we've been in this business um, almost 20 years, and um, over the last 10 years, focused almost exclusively on data centers. Um, and that means that we have, um, you know, we're headquartered in Silicon Valley, we have operations around the world, um, but we have um, extended relationships and deep relationships with, um, with all the, the largest hyperscalers, right? So um, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Dropbox, PayPal, um, you see some of the names uh, on this list that are public, but we're really um, involved with, with almost everyone. And, and that allows us to, to really facilitate that circularity from the beginning. So we're involved in the design stages, either in OCP or with, with the, the original vendors directly. We're involved uh, when the equipment is deployed by the, um, uh, by the vendors I just listed, listed, 
listed. And then um, we're involved um, in the um, in the the Second Life uh, process from there. So that's really where that the material I said the thirty five thousand to hundred thousand servers per month. Um, we have over a million servers um, currently in our inventory, and um, we will process probably a million and a half uh, servers over the next twelve months. And that's where we draw the material uh, for Sesame. So we're able to do those five, ten, twenty uh, racks at a time. Um, with um, with very high volume, very high quality, right? Um, and yeah, so I already mentioned uh, uh, the the scope of the operations. Just uh, there's a picture here. You know, if, uh, over 600 uh, employees worldwide. Um, there's a, a a group of them gathered um, in uh, in one of our facilities. Um, but it it really is a a global industry, and uh, and and so we uh, respond to that uh, to that in kind and and access you know all kinds of, of verticals and all types of operations. Right, very interesting. Thanks for explaining that. It gives me a very good overview for sure, and uh, I think we can just move on actually to the next question because we have a good one here. How can the Asperitas approach alongside IT Renew provide the most sustainable integrated solution. Now, Andy. That one for me. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, so I've I've already mentioned about um, heat recovery. So yeah, um, heat recovery is really uh, has always been a great potential for all kinds of industries. You know, waste heat is a big part of, um, of um, big byproducts of um, so many things. Um, uh, the same goes for the data center industry, of course, uh, as we already mentioned. Now, uh, capturing that heat and doing something useful with it really depends on, uh, well, there's lots of heat, but the, the quality of it, the temperature of it is often too low to really get it into, you know, put it to work without investing a lot of extra energy, you know, compressors, that kind of thing. So if we can return the heat um, in great quantities, at high temperatures, then we're in business. Then we can really start to, uh, you know, make a good value proposition. The great thing about um, working with immersion cooling and working with IT Renew is that uh, the 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 amount of power that we get and the temperature that it can operate at is in quite a good sweet spot. Okay, um, that we have more than enough capacity to cool and because of that we can engineer the system in such a way for the return temperatures to be to be high enough to get use out of that waste heat so ashray who do set the standards um came up with liquid cooling classifications and they call it w12345 w is for water they have a similar uh, series of classes for air Obviously, they start with A instead. Um, so the W4 um, is where we don't use uh, refrigeration for the water circuit. And W5, though, is where we start getting into high return temperatures for heat recovery. So the return temperature where it goes above 45 degrees centigrade uh, is where we can start to put that heat to good use, to heat buildings. Um, and if you... There are other things that you can do too, but that's pretty much the way that the heat goes. So on the screen, you can see just quickly three examples of where heat recovery uh, can be applied for data centers and district heating. So integrating the data center to uh, really something that is sort of the city, uh, city scale district heating system um can be done for hyperscale of course for edge computing too wherever you have a local heat demand then you can uh, set up the system in a way to provide heat for urban areas and then of course at the edge so as 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 well and for add-on data centers which are in a containerized uh, solution so really is part of the thermal management um engineering works uh, the business case, of course, you need to look at the demand for the heat. But if it's there, uh, then we can we can run the system in such a way with ITV new hardware and a, and a Spiritas immersion cooling to have that high return temperature and to have high quality heat uh, available. And um, of course, that that has a great impact on the business case. It's a great value proposition, but 
you can imagine the benefits um, for uh, carbon emissions too. And also just, just seeing that whole, whole um, approach of integration, you know, data centers are such a big part of our lives. You know, we use data all the time, but um, they can do much more for us as, as, as well, uh, including providing you with warm hands. What a fantastic uh, solution that is. Absolutely. Yeah, of course, I couldn't agree more. And Eric, I think you'll probably have some things to add to this one. Yeah, I think one of the, you know, one of the, the examples here, the second example here talks about edge computing, right? And and there's, that is a, a massive kind of synergy here with multiple layers, right? Because as computing becomes more and more ubiquitous in our lives, but also easier to deploy, um, it's, it often is much more rational to, to put it more uh, closely to the, to the population or, or to the, the particular application when we think about um, smart cities and, uh, and smart electrical grids and, and, and so on. Um, and, and the technology is really readily available for that, right? And then uh, in a sustainability perspective, you can, uh, you can go in places where there is, is, uh, is clean energy, renewable energy, right? You can go to places where the computing is needed, and then uh, you can use the, uh, the waste energy in, in the ways that Andy just described. So it's, it's a super, super wide set of, of opportunities, right? And then as we see here, um, you know, we're really um, kind of summarizing the, the joint benefits um, uh, between the two companies. Uh, so we're able to, uh, to take the kind of the unparalleled expertise from, uh, from Asperitas in um, the cooling, the, the stability, the, the energy uh, uh, reuse, um, bringing that efficiency together with the, um, the hyperscale technology that we're, we're both pulling from, from OCP and from our uh, upstream clients and bring that into that, that virtuous um, kind of circular uh, supply chain where there's basically carbon savings at, uh, at, at multiple layers, right? So the, the, we're really you know, dropping the, the carbon footprint by, um, by significant amounts, um, as we've already said, you know, 50%, 75%, um, and, uh, and, and doing it very cost effectively, right? And, and so really the, the combination is great, um, as we've already said, for, for both enterprises and, uh, and CSPs, right? So obviously a large scale service provider with a, with a global audience needs to think about these types of scenarios, but even, even enterprises are, should be quite interested in, in saving money, <laughs> in um, you know, uh, being more, more effective uh, uh, stewards for the environment and uh, you know, improving the, the scalability and, and, uh, and power, um, power to value of their their IT infrastructure, so we're we're really um, glad when whenever a you know a, a large corporation comes to us and, and says you know hey we heard that you can um, help us with sustainability you know what's the what's the trick and and then we we eventually you know explain to them oh there's there's no trick actually it's uh, it performs better it costs less and uh, it's uh, it's better for the environment so this is a, a great combination for a, a wide range of of customers out there. Yeah, exactly. Quite straightforward, right? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Very interesting. So we'll move on, shall we? For who is this an interesting solution? Eric, would you like to start with this one? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, and, and so, so of course we've we've already outlined a number of these, right? So um, the uh, there is there is absolutely a sweet spot in in high density uh, uh, data center usage, right? Um, taking uh, multiple racks, uh, you know, um, dense with cassettes, and then and then multiple of these modules, as um, as we see in the videos here, right? Dense on the inside with uh, with networking. So this is inside the cassettes. Remember, each one of these cassettes. Uh, holds three nodes, uh, so this is a, a you know a, a massive uh, amount of uh, of computing, um, but uh, but it can also it can also scale down as we talked about in those in those edge scenarios. Um, we have um, often customers that will put um, you know a hundred nodes in a hundred locations, just as we have customers that will put a thousand nodes in in ten locations or um, you know uh, ten thousand nodes in in each of two locations. Right, if if they just have a, a main and a and a disaster recovery site, right? So the 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 ubiquity of of computing is really something that we can um, uh, kind of respond to um, with uh, with uh, with this joint uh, a joint technology, 
right? Um, you don't have to, to do you know, massive uh, data center redesign, massive building uh, redesign in order to, um, uh, to use this, uh, this combined solution. And so it's, it's really is um, widely applicable for, um, uh, for basically all, all computing use cases worldwide. Interesting. Andy, could you elaborate further on this? Well, really, just enjoying the videos as, as well and just yeah. imagining this, the, uh, I mean, um, full of uh, Tioga passes and Yosemites and, and all sorts of great, um, you know, kind of wedge switch and all sorts of stuff in there. But, um, I, and also to say, you probably saw the, the on the on this image here, you, you can see the power connections at the top. So we have PDU uh, power solutions, but also bus bar solutions so too, which, which are currently uh, in uh, prototyping. So there are, uh, just to, to, to say that this, this is a good example for just uh, seeing this with, with the, the uh, bus bar and, the, and all the IT we need would be, would be uh, you know, really great. Um, also, you, uh, you can see the um, immersion environment here quite nicely in some of the images. The liquid, it's a dielectric. It's actually a byproduct of, um, of a process uh, and uh, is provided by Shell uh, and itself has, has really great uh, uh, performance in, in mechanical terms for cooling um, with it expanding and rising as it heats, but also um, you know, it it uh, doesn't have any 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 issues with um, uh, global warming potential. Uh, it's not volatile. Uh, it, you know, it doesn't evaporate. It doesn't. Uh, you don't lose it when you open the lid. Um, so you know, in terms of the life you know, and cost, uh, but also in terms of its environmental credentials, it's actually really quite a great uh, solution in that way too. Uh, I love the lighting as well. I'm not sure that all the LEDs come as uh, standard though, um, but uh, yeah, I think it would be sure it enables you to see inside the the environment and really you know see how it's uh, going to give a great immersion cooling environment for all the IT. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's nice to to see he's actually seeing a bit of uh, see it in action, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Let's move on, shall we? Um, Andy, it would be good for you to explain a little bit more about the upgrades and how scalable is this solution actually. Absolutely. So uh, the 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 module that we just looked at um, is designed to be flexible, um, and the 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 concept of immersion cooling, you know, what could be simpler. Um, so being able to change out your IT equipment uh, should you want to or need to, um, the module is the same. Uh, the cassette uh, that contains it, that's where the changes are. So the, the, the changes are, are contained. Um, so it's scalable in the sense of if you change your IT, then you don't have to change anything above than just the cassette that simply holds the, the IT equipment in place in the liquid. Um, also, the, we, we call it a module for the reason that they can be joined uh, together, chained together, in terms of the the the, um, the water supply and the power um, supplies, so in the image here you can see a series of them. Um, so they're designed to work well singularly, and also together they're designed to have minimum uh, floor space claim, and to all the serviceable equipment is easy to access to uh, even with the lid open uh, that you know these things can be positioned in a, in a way where you have space to, uh, to work but the space claim of them is uh, minimized yeah so it's uh, great it works in the data center environment um, and also as we saw in some of the examples those three examples uh, for heat recovery um, it also works great in the edge and in containerized uh, solutions too. There are two sizes. There's, there's, there's um, one that's based on a 15 inch um, server uh, width and a 21 inch. And each of them have uh, uh, 24U. Um, and we feel that them having the, you know, their own heat exchanges locally 
also means that the um, and they have two heat exchangers and two power systems in each of them. So redundancy uh, is part of that scalability and integration as well. Thanks, Andy. I think we can just move on to the next one, actually. And Eric, we'll, we'll begin with you this time. How fast can this solution be delivered? Everyone wants to know. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, so we've, 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 of course, talked about the, you know, the, the certification, some of the validation processes, all the design processes that go on. Uh, the good news is that we've, we've already uh, taken care of those. You know, we're, uh, we've been active uh, in this partnership for, uh, uh, for a significant amount of time. And of course, uh, through the standardization effort. But then the, uh, the, a piece that, that is actually quite important um, in our model, but, but also, you know, being felt now in the industry generally is um, the supply chain uh, process here, right? So um, IP Renew, um, I, I said it a few minutes ago. So we're able to deliver uh, racks, uh, pr fully integrated racks to our customers on you know, two weeks and, and three weeks notice, right? And, and that's an existing customer with an existing design. We're also able to make you know, design adaptations on a, on a pretty rapid level. Um, but because we have you know, the balance of our materials um, already um, in our warehouses, um, in many cases already you know, pre-tested and, uh, and in some cases pre-integrated, we do just a final rack level integration step to the customer specifications, do a final rack level uh, test. And then, as I said, you know, put that, uh, uh, that rack on the truck um, so that it can be uh, deployed in a data center. So um, it's uh, it, uh, delivery from, from order to, uh, to on the ground. Um, we can be within, uh, within two weeks. Um, we actually have a recent customer example where they complained because we delivered the equipment too quickly. <laughs> um, they, uh, they, they were not ready in their, in their loading dock. They were wow. still processing the other equipment. Uh, uh, we literally had to find a temporary storage for, for three days uh, because we were, we were too fast uh, on the delivery. So that's uh, and obviously uh, uh, you know, an, an email that, uh, that you love to read uh, in, in many ways. So, uh, Absolutely. Yeah, it's a good problem to have, isn't it? <laughs> Um, Andy, would you like to make any uh, final comments? This is the last question, right? So fire ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, um, just to say, um, yeah, this is a turnkey solution, and um, you know the engine, as as we said before, due to it it, it being known IT uh, equipment that you know we it, the engineering is all worked out across that full range, and we're ready when you. Excellent. Well, that's a good note to end on for sure. Um, just that, uh, thank you very much, um, gentlemen, for um, participating in this third Frequently Asked Questions episode. And I look forward to the next one, as always. And thank you very much to the listeners and viewers for tuning in. If anyone has any more questions, please refer to the Asperitas and IT Renew websites, which you can see here. You can also request an online demonstration to discuss the integrated technology in more depth. Lastly, you can connect with both of these speakers on LinkedIn, if you wish. That's all from us. And thanks again to Andy and Eric. See you at the next episode. Thanks, Amelia. Thanks, Amelia, for hosting. Thank you.